So um, let's start with entrepreneurship. You're the founder and CEO of Housekeep, which is the UK's biggest tech marketplace for cleaners and now tradespeople. And you've built this business from just an idea into a really successful brand. What advice would you give to other startup entrepreneurs? There's many people listening to the show now, they've got an idea for a business or they're just on those early stages. What tips, what recommendations, what insights can you share with them? Absolutely, so very happy to do so. So advice piece one, uh, which I've said before and I'll say it again, is do not do it. Um, starting a business is a long, hard, crazy journey, as you'll know. Uh, you have to work all hours God sends, it takes over your life, it's you know, a real thing you have to commit to. And um, the odds are, on average, it won't work. That's what the, the, the math says. And so it's got a poor return on your time and money, it's a bad investment for, for, for yourself. So to do it, you have to be a little bit crazy. You have to believe that the odds don't apply to you. You have to believe that your idea is better than the average. You have to believe you are better than the average. You have to be a little bit of a dreamer, in other words. And so, to some extent, you know, that advice, don't do it. What I'm trying to say is if, if I can put you off, then you definitely shouldn't do it. You're going to need a lot more grit and determination than that. Yeah. That's advice piece one. Don't do it. If you insist, on defying the odds, on defying gravity, uh, defying me and, and, and my advice. I think there are probably two really critical things I would say to people who are gonna make the leap. The first is people. Find yourself some co-founders. Uh, the data on uh, companies who, uh, uh, founding teams that succeed is uh, teams with multiple founders have a much greater chance of success. Yes. And having done it as a solo founder, I would say that having other people around me would have been a great help in those early days. Me, me too. <laughs> well, there you go. And, and, and as you've probably found, even though I didn't have co-founders, I had a right-hand man and left-hand woman in tech and ops, respectively, who kind of kept me sane and kept me afloat when the going got really tough. So even if you don't have co-founders, you need a handful of people you can really rely on. Um, which I guess you've probably found in your business as exactly. well. And then the second is you want to fail as quickly as you possibly can. And the way I thought about that is what things do I need to prove are not true in order to continue? So if you take housekeep marketplace for cleaners and tradespeople, the first, first, first thing I worried about was will people pay a premium price for the service that we would deliver? Because if they wouldn't, there was no point carrying on. You couldn't make money charging the same amount that was already charged in the grey economy because there was no margin for us to make. Yeah. So that was the assumption I tested first. Can we get people to pay more? If not, let's just stop doing this altogether. Sec the answer to that was yes, if the service quality is good. So the second thing I tested is can we get the service level that's high enough to retain people at a higher price, dot, dot, dot. Mm. And those gates, as the business gets more mature and uh, there's more data and more information to prove it works, those gates get further apart and they become less severe and less like a, you must pass that gate or the business fails. But th those, if you're going to do it, surround yourself with some good people early on who you can rely on, whether they be co-founders or otherwise, and second, try to fail as quickly as you can. Uh, and figure out, in other words, test the risky assumptions first. Yeah, running a thousand experiments, seeing what's going to work, what's not going to work, and then doubling down on, on what does work. And I, I love that because you have to learn quickly and not repeat the same mistakes. And failure is something that if you bring it on yourself as an entrepreneur by trying something, that's great. But sometimes failure can come from external environments which can completely destroy what you're working on and sometimes you just don't have any control over it right so for example during covid you lost 80 percent of your business in 10 days yeah how the hell did you recover from that because that is crazy it was it, <laughs> it was pretty crazy you could uh amazed i could laugh about it you could refresh a page you can see the numbers go down and I'd be looking at it thinking, you must be kidding. And you know, the, the, the news would be on and you'd refresh the page, the numbers would go down and you'd think, oh my God, where's the, where's the bottom here? It turns out the bottom is 20%. Um, I think there's, there, were, there were two parts to, to, to surviving COVID. Uh, so, well, the right word, I suppose. Part one was survival. 
Um, we're a pretty lean business. Yes, we'd raised a little bit of money, but for the size of business we'd become at that point, we had very little cash in the bank. And I'll be honest, I wasn't completely sure we could survive it um, at the time. And survival involved two things, really. One was focusing on the core business model. And our core belief is that when a customer who wants a regular cleaner is matched up with a cleaner who they like and they go on repeat every week, that relationship's really solid. And that proved to be true. And that's what the 20% was. It was the super strong, sticky relationships between customers and cleaners, really strong, trusted relationships. Um, and that people really care about and they're willing to pay for it. It's really resilient. And we were even willing to put up prices during COVID mm. for that model. Mm. And that's a big chunk of what, what made the business work. Sure. The second part was saying for these customers who really trust Housekeep, who even in, the, in a pandemic still trust us to, to be in their home and to look after their home, uh, can we sell other things to them? And some of that was pretty tactical. For example, we did some hospital cleaning, which is absolutely not core. Yeah. But really what stuck actually was the expansion to tradespeople services. We found people who trust us to have a cleaner in the house would also trust us to have a garden in the garden or an electrician or a plumber or a handyman or, or whatever it might be. So that was the kind of survival piece, getting through the first handful of months. The second part was the, I guess, thriving again part. And I think it's true that Housekeep today in 2024 thrives. We just posted a best ever month in, in March, in April, in May, which is, is, is great. But if I'm honest, I'm not sure that was always true in terms of post-COVID. I think for a while we, um, we didn't recognise how things had changed. Sure. And, and we weren't leaning into market conditions, which I think you really have to be doing. What's going on in my market today that I can lean into? And a good example of this is in 2022, if you remember the hospitality industry reopening this sort of big bang. Um, this was Rishi's plan, right? Uh, I think it was actually this, I think this was after Eat Out to Help Out. Okay. This was when the sort of, then they closed everything again. Then it all reopened again. So there was a huge amount of demand for hospitality, retail works, people who could switch between, say, cleaning jobs yeah. or care jobs. Sure. And inflation started to go up, prices started to go up. And we thought, gosh, you know, we've got to get our volume back. We've lost that 80%. We want to get our volume back. So let's get more customers, more jobs going. And what everybody else was doing in that market was saying, inflation is high, we're going to raise prices. And we were thinking, we've got to get our volume back, we've got to get our volume back. So we didn't want to raise prices. By the time, and what that meant was we didn't have enough cleaning supply because cleaners could get much better pay elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. By the time we reacted, uh, bizarrely, by holding the line and holding the line on pricing, it was almost back into recession territory when inflation started to get rampant at the end of 2022, the economic news was pretty bad. So we held on pricing, later than everybody else. Then we raised prices basically into the teeth of a recession. Mm -hmm. And we got loads of cancellations in a way we wouldn't have got six months earlier. And the lesson from the, the Thrive part of COVID is market conditions are going to change and you've got to lean into them, not trying to fight them. Sure. Um, and I think that's a lesson that's cost us a bit actually over time. But yeah. hey, you, li you live and you learn. Well, managed to get it all sorted in the end and, uh, and on to better things. Um, Post-COVID, Boris Johnson awarded you with an MBE, which is pretty cool. I'm sure mum and dad were very proud. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about how that happened. Well, technically, mum and dad were, I think, mostly confused. They were sort of, you know, cause the, hi, mum, dad, uh, I've got this letter and it's um, an MBE. And you could tell they're like, an MBA? You know, because it's such an unexpected thing. I think it took them a few days to figure out what it was. And also, technically, I think it was, I think my, the recommendation was from the Queen and the award was from the King. So no Boris Johnson involved in it. Um, so there's, there's a boring answer and a sort of slightly... Amusing. Was Boris the Prime Minister at the time? He was. Okay, okay. So. I, well, he was the recommender, I believe, to the Honours Committee okay, or whatever it was. Okay. Uh, but yeah, he was. And um, I don't know who was Prime Minister by the time I received it. It'd be hard, hard to guess. There's been so many recently. Exactly, yeah, it could be anyone. Um, so the boring story, I suppose, is during COVID, when the government was trying to figure out guidance for uh, different working settings, one of them being work in people's homes, uh, we helped with quite a lot of creating guidance around how to do that safely and published extensive guidance on a website and lots of people borrowed from that. And I think that was probably how I got on the sort of radar of yeah. an entrepreneur who's done something that's sort of meaningful. 
They've put tens of millions of pounds to the pockets of cleaners who are some of the lowest paid workers in the UK. I think all of that's, I think, I think what, what, what happened. But, but I, I say I think because I don't know, because what actually happened was I was in the office on a Friday afternoon and I used to live around the corner. Uh, there's a porter in that building. He sent me a text saying, you've got an important looking letter. Friday, 3.30 in the afternoon, went around the corner. There's this yellow envelope with cabinet office printed on it. It's a heavy, thick envelope. And i would not seen this, uh, Thomas, the chap around the corner, for a few months. And she was talking about his kids, asking about my kids, asking about how work was and the weather and his holidays. And I'm like, what's in this envelope? You know, what is this thing? And I was like, I'm either getting arrested or I'm getting some sort of award. And I was like, well, if I'm getting arrested, the, I, I'm not sure that I've done anything that deserves... I mean, you know, I've done it... I've, made a few mistakes, but I'm not sure I should be arrested for them. Yeah, yeah. And I like, I'm not sure they arrest people through letter nowadays. Yeah. So I'm like, hmm, that's like, maybe I'm getting an award. And I honestly, I thought, please, Thomas, please stop speaking to me. And I didn't <laughs> want to be rude. So this went on for about half an hour. Yeah, yeah, then yeah. I could have got out of there, came back around the corner and opened this envelope. And then the way it's written, it does reference uh, the Prime Minister at the time. It says, Dear Abby, I'm writing to inform you that on the recommendation of the Right Honourable Prime Minister Boris Johnson, you are to be recommended to the Honours Committee on behalf of the dot dot. Like, what? What does all this mean? mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the next paragraph says, of course, you must uphold the stricter standards of public blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, so is this just the letter that everyone gets? Is this just like, you know, every, all 65 million of us get a letter and it says you might be on the list or am I on a short list or have I got it? Or, sure. yeah. uh, so this went on for a while and eventually you have to send in a form and I kind of, I don't know if I'm the only person that's ever done this or everyone does this, but in the email I was like, have I actually got it? <laughs> and they were like, yes, you have it. <laughs> Congratulations. And then obviously then the rest is uh, announced publicly a few days later. Yeah. Um, well, an amazing achievement, regardless of, of the, uh, the strange process. <laughs> some of the confusion, yeah, yeah. thank you.